We commence our worship this evening by singing hymn number 281. 281. A fullness resides in Jesus our head, and ever abides to answer our need. The Father's good pleasure has laid up in store a plentiful treasure to give to the poor. 281. Let us pray together. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you this evening. We are seeking your blessing upon us in the name of your only beloved Son, the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Who is a pardoning God like thee, or who has grace so rich, so free? We rejoice in the Lord this evening, knowing that in Him there is hope. In Him there is forgiveness, full and free. In Him there is a glorious inheritance that awaits your people. We ask this evening that you would cleanse us afresh and grant to us hearts which desire to worship you, the living God, hearts which yearn to know God, to commune with God, in the holy place. Sadly, O Lord, we have to confess 
Her Christian life is sometimes like coming out of a huge supermarket with just a packet of polos when there is so much available for us from the throne of grace, from the goodness of God. Forgive us, O Lord, when we content ourselves with so little spiritually, when there is an infinite storehouse of spiritual riches to gain through prayer. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for your abundant goodness toward us as the God of all grace. We have ex experienced your saving grace, your securing grace, your sustaining grace, and we most certainly need daily grace to walk as a true Christian. Help us to mortify the flesh, to put off the old and put on the new in our Christian walk, and be living more according to the new man of grace. And our Heavenly Father, as we live in these difficult times, may we be given wisdom and strength to respond and to live wisely as people of knowledge and understanding. Help us as a church to be a witness as your people in our community. And may the ministry of the website be truly blessed and practical support given be a means of blessing to others. May many turn to the living God in these days and cry out, in repentance and come by faith to your provision in the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And as we consider the abundant mercies of God this evening, may our hearts be encouraged and fed spiritually, and may grace reign in our hearts rather than self. May the truths of your word make a true impact upon our lives for good, in salvation and sanctification and may your name be magnified in our hearts. We ask these mercies in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We turn to our second hymn, number 417. I know that my Redeemer lives, what joy the blessed assurance gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives, my everlasting head. Four one seven.
please turn with me to the word of God for our instruction in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be reading through this letter we have read in the previous Lord's Day evenings, chapter 1 and chapter 2. And this evening we're going to read chapter 3. Wives, submit, be submissive, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. And do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. And rather let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. But in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and not af- and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honour to the wife, as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit, Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defence to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that, when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is, is also an antitype, which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. And so reads the holy divine word of God in 1 Peter chapter 3. And now we turn to sing our next hymn, which is number 279. A beautiful name I have heard, with sound of salvation to me, God's only begotten and word, this Jesus of blessed Calvary, 279.
I would ask you to please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to our living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And the subject before us this evening is God the Father's Abundant Mercy. God the Father's Abundant Mercy. And uh, the verse 3 commences, as we have read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have praise being given to the very source of all blessing, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when it's speaking here of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the full name given here, the Lord, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, speaking of his deity, Jesus, the Saviour of the world, his mission, Christ, the Anointed One of God, the Father for this mission, the Anointed One of God, the Father for this mission, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is the God and Father of Jesus Christ as this relates to his human nature. While living here on earth, Jesus Christ was subject to God, his Father, in his human nature as the perfect man. As the perfect man, he obeyed God, his Father, perfectly, being obedient unto God, delighting to do his will. But notice here that the Apostle Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord title, I remind you again, is speaking also of his authority, his deity, as the second person in the Trinity. So to call Jesus Lord is to confess that he is God, So we must be very careful we do not misunderstand this verse. Peter is not meaning here that God is God of the Lord in his deity. Only God of Jesus Christ in his humanity. There is no hierarchy uh, or different levels in the Godhead. All are equally God. There are different roles. So God in his relationship is the Father of our divine Lord, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God, eternally proceeding from the Father. The Son of God, eternally begotten of God the Father. He is equally God with the Father and the Spirit as the second person of the Trinity, as God the Son, the Lord. Matthew Henry uh, puts it this way, He says, here it's speaking of the God of Christ according to his human nature and his Father according to his divine nature. But notice here how Peter writes the God and Father of our Lord and Jesus Christ. We can call God as our Father only through the person and work of his only beloved Son. Here abundant praise is focused on the first person of the Trinity, particularly the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we will be considering here this evening three reasons which are given to praise God the Father for his abundant mercy, who according to his abundant mercy... Now, uh, the word abundant here has the meaning of being right at the top end of the scale, 
immeasurable, actually. There is no scale, actually. Uh, it is actually immeasurable. God's mercy is abundant, being the source of the Christian's hope, inheritance and union with God. For according to God's abundant mercy, we have a living hope, a living inheritance and a living union. And they are the three uh, reasons given here in our text. And these are the three points we are now going to consider. A living hope, a living inheritance and a living union all the experience of the born again Christian all because of God's abundant mercy according to his abundant mercy we have a living hope because we are begotten who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope well the word begotten here means created spiritually born spiritually from above united to God in Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit the spiritual nature given to Adam at creation was marred and deadened because of sin when he fell every person born after the fall is devoid of a spiritual nature after God they are dead in trespasses and sins and therefore to enter into a proper relationship with God we must be born again spiritually. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This means we must be given again that spiritual nature like Adam had before the fall. Indeed this new spiritual nature given is even more glorious than Adam had, in this sense that it cannot be taken away again by Satan. It lasts for eternity. And this spiritual nature uh, is not manufactured by human hands or human ingenuity or human wisdom. This new nature is given by God. It is a miracle done in us by God's Holy Spirit, the work of regeneration leading to conversion. And God adopts us into his family. We are ordained unto life according to his uh, uh, sovereign grace and purposes. We have begotten us again unto a living hope. Every true Christian is a person born again spiritually. They are given a spiritual nature uh, receptive to God. Only God under the power of his Holy Spirit can bring about this miracle of the new birth, wherein we are given a new nature that loves God and seeks to obey him and learn of him. The work of the Holy Spirit is controlled by God and not man. In John 3 verse 8 we read, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is every one who is born of the Spirit. It is a sovereign work of God. But how is it evidenced? It is evidenced in us by repentance. A realisation of what we are before a holy God. Confession. A turning unto God. Our pride is smitten. And man finally sees through God's illuminating grace that he is totally devoid of any spiritual good. He is dead in trespasses and sins. A person may be very respectable, uh, a very respectable sinner, but he is a sinner all the same. This is a humbling discovery which smites our pride to the forehead. Repentance, the only God-ordained way forward. Under this realisation... And then it is evidenced by faith, trusting only in the finished work of Christ for our salvation. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And so repentance and faith are evidences of the sovereign grace of God working in your life. In Romans 10, 9 if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
And then another uh, evidence uh, of the work of the Holy Spirit, having been begotten again unto a living hope, is your relationship to the Word of God. You have been touched by the Word of God, and you submit uh, to the authority of uh, the Word of God, having been born again, Peter said later in this chapter, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides for ever. Submitting to the authority of God's word. As you open God's word, the question is, what is the Lord saying to me in his word uh, today? And then another evidence of uh, being begotten, begotten again to a living hope uh, is um, prayer. Prayer. You remember how when the Apostle Paul was converted, when he was named Saul and he was a rebel and an angry man. And Ananias was told to speak to Paul and he was frightened. But behold, he's praying. This was the evidence. A personal communion with God. We value prayer. And then desire. A desire to know the work and fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. These pure desires, these spiritual desires, these longings after God and his word and fellowship with the Lord's people and fellowship with the Father through the Son and longing for the work of the Holy Spirit within. All these are evidences, repentance, faith, the word of God, prayer, a desire. And then lifestyle is another evidence to live a God-honouring life. We do not try to live holy lives to be saved. We seek to live holy lives because we are saved by faith in Christ. It is a fruit of faith. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. But then secondly, according to his abundant mercy, we have a living hope. Living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, uh, according to his abundant mercy, he has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection from the dead. The living hope spoken of here is something absolutely certain, a better hope than any other. Its confirmation is in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Christ's resurrection is the seal of eternal life. It is the evidence that there is such a thing as eternal life. This hope is an anchor to the Christian faith. And we read in Hebrews 6, 19, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. The hope is the anchor to the Christian faith. It is immovable, it's certain. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the grand confirmation of all that had gone before through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from uh, the dead. It confirmed that he is indeed the Son of God. He was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. We have a living hope because he is risen. There is assurance this evening because Christ is risen. And when Christ was uh, resurrected, he confirmed that his sacrifice upon the cross had been accepted by God the Father. It confirmed his victory over sin and death and hell, his victory over Satan. It confirmed the truth of the word of God. It confirmed the reality of eternal life. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ forms part of the sure and certain and living hope of uh, the Christian And so Paul, in writing to the church at Thessalonica, says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us 
everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. Friends, this living hope is a good hope. It's a healthy hope. It's a well-being hope. It is a secure hope. It is a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. According then to his abundant mercy, we have living hope. But then, according to his abundant mercy, we have living inheritance. Verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. That does not fade away. A living inheritance. One thing about this world we are constantly reminded about is of its change and decay. The hymn writer said, change and decay in all around I see, yet thou who changest not abide with me. Now there are four characteristics about the Christian inheritance which the Apostle Peter assures us of. And there he reminds us uh, in this verse that it is incorruptible. It's incorruptible. Whereas here on earth things perish, the heavenly inheritance is incorruptible. And so uh, the Lord Jesus encourages us to seek this inheritance. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. It is an unfading inheritance. It is not decaying. It's not spoiling. It's not rusting away. It's not losing its grandeur. It's not losing its colour. You know how a picture on a wall uh, with the sun rays upon it, the UV ray, rays, uh, 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 can uh, affect uh, the beauty of the picture because some of the colours of it fade uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is an unfading inheritance its beauty does not fade away its glory does not fade away it is incorruptible and you know, my dear friends, this evening, how assuring is this? We have been told that we are entering a depression and a recession that could be the worst for 300 years. It, it will certainly be the worst in our living memory. And we do not know what the future holds. There is so much unknown, uh, not only about the, the pandemic, but about the financial outcome. And so the Lord's people, even though they may well themselves be deeply affected uh, 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 providentially, there is a hope. There is a living hope. There is a living inheritance we look forward to. And this should help us by faith to cling more and more to our dear Saviour. This this inheritance, we read, is undefiled. God uh, looked upon his creation and he pronounced it to be good. In Genesis 1.31, then God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. And so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. But then sin entered into this world and defiled God's beautiful work of creation. We know now uh, there is much uh, in this world with uh, uh, pollution uh, which uh, defiles God's beautiful work of creation. And in these more recent weeks, pictures are being shown of what happens when the millions of vehicles are taken off the road. And, and, and uh, uh, some of the pollution that is pumped into the air is no longer. And all the aircraft, thousands of them in the air at the same time. And now the stars can be seen beautifully. Uh, and uh, 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 we live in a world uh, which is uh, corrupted. But heaven is incorruptible. It is not possible that it, it could ever be defiled by sin or defilement. 
Uh, reading this week of some Christians who are serving the Lord in the Niger Delta region. Sadly, one of those uh, dear brothers was murdered. But they were writing uh, 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 in the introduction part of the creative beauty of that area they worked in. But some parts of it were now totally devastated and polluted by the oil wells. Defiled. But this heavenly inheritance is incorruptible. It is undefiled. It is ever living. It is ever living. Does not fade away. Our ambitions fade away at times. Holidays are fading away at this year. Financial security is certainly fading away. Precious moments fade away. Our lives are fading away. But the certainty and eternity of our heavenly home remains. It does not fade away. And it is personally reserved. The Apostle Peter assures us that every Christian believer has a place reserved in heaven. An entry into the fullness of salvation in heaven is already assured. Reserved in heaven for you. There is a booking, we might say, a reservation, and there will be no mistake, no double bookings. Each one of God's people has a personal reservation. It is not a reservation made by man but a reservation made by God. And therefore we can be assured of it. It means an inheritance kept, laid up, guarded, preserved, eternally secure for you. And then a living union, kept, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now we can never make our own way to heaven without being kept by the power of God. Shielded by God's power, safe and secure in God's garrison of grace and power. When we are converted, we enter into a living union with God. It is a partnership of God's power in harmony with our God-given faith that we are to exercise. This is the essence of the union. And because of this, the Apostle Peter is assuring us of two things. The future is guarded by God and the present is guarded by God. The word kept here is in the continuing sense. God will guard your hearts continually. We are kept by the power of God continually. Our final deliverance of salvation from the power and presence of sin is through the guarding power of God. Our God-given faith in Christ being in exercise with and in union with the essential personal power of God. God has dealt with the past. He is dealing with the present. And he will ensure the future in glory. The abundant mercy of our God and Father, Jesus Christ. Begotten us again to a living hope in Christ. Granted to us a living inheritance in glory and secured a living union who are kept by the power of God through faith the exercise of our faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time personally reserved a dwelling place in heaven Edmund Clowney as he considered this verse, speaking of the hope, said, Our hope is anchored in the past. Jesus rose again from the dead. 
Our hope remains in the present. Jesus lives. He's risen from the dead. Our hope is complete in the future. Jesus Christ is coming again at the end of time. And so uh, this evening we have considered the abundant mercy of our God and Father Jesus Christ. And we have sought to consider three particular aspects of this abundant mercy. A living hope, a living inheritance and a living union. May we praise God from whom all blessings flow. What a verse we have here to help us through these difficult days. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our conclusion hymn is number 198. Hymn number 198. Thy mercy, my God, is the theme of my song, the joy of my heart and the boast of my tongue. Thy free grace alone, from the first to the last, hath won my affection and bound my soul fast. One nine eight. Oh
And now may the grace of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and the love of God our Heavenly Father and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and continue with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen.